Okay, so um, as this slide says, my name is Christopher Carr, or just Chris, and uh, I'm talking about a uh, DAG-based framework for cryptocurrencies. And uh, this is something I've been working on uh, for, a, for a while now. Um, so what's a DAG? Uh, and that's a really good question. And it, I always think of the film Snatch because uh, it's like, uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> Motivate, so, so my, port, my talk will go along these lines. There's an introduction, what is a DAG? Uh, why do we want to use them? Then I will talk about this graph chain framework. Um, it was originally this DAG-based framework that we kind of wrote about a while ago uh, that we've called the graph chain for reasons of naming things. People like names for things. Um, then we talk about the design choices, the main challenges, and then I'm going to obviously have a conclusion. Um, Right, so, uh, but just in case you're uh, interested in what, where this came from, um, I originally wrote this paper with a couple of guys, Xavier Boyen, a guy called Thomas Haynes. Uh, in 2016, we put this on ePrint, and there's like a perhaps more readable version in this Ursim News um, article uh, uh, 220 or something on blockchain engineering. Um, of course, this work is also published and stuff in other areas, but um, these are probably the most easy to find uh, things. Anyway, um, yeah, so this work, I started in 2016, uh, in like February 2016, with, um, when DAGs weren't really that big of a thing. Or there's some stuff on blogs um, about them, but nobody really knew what was going on and why we might want one. So uh, a DAG-based design. Um, First, what, is, what do we mean by DAG? We mean a directed acyclic graph. So this sort of comes from this mathematical term for a graph, which is uh, consi and generally you have this um, set, which consists of two other sets of vertices and edges. So edges are just ordered pairs of vertices, and they're normally represented as arrows if, you're using a, if you have a directed graph. And a graph is a cyclic if you kind of can't start from one vertex and get back to the other following the arrows. So you might understand that that is not exactly a mathematical term. But uh, yeah, um, for an example, that's an example of a DAG. So edges, arrows, and vertices, the orange boxes. Um, yeah, and you can sort of just see by inspection here that there are no um, cycles. You can't start at one of these um, orange boxes and follow the arrows and get back to an orange box. Right, that's a DAG. You can also label these DAGs, and if you do, you can have what is called a partially ordered set. So in, this, in the work that we did, we talk a lot about partially ordered sets. And um, <clears throat> the idea here is, uh, that you can sort it, you have a partial ordering because if you sort of define an arrow going to something as being higher than the one that the arrow is coming from, you can easily see that K is above all of these other um, num uh, letters. But you can also quite quickly see that F and H, there's no ordering between the two of them, right? We, all we know about F and H is that they're above D and that they're below I. So it's a partial order. Um, unlike another kind of DAG that we're all familiar with, which is the blockchain, which is totally ordered. Um, and occasionally you get these um, uh, quite fun. Actually, it's really fun if you start thinking about uh, how you end up with uh, uh, these orphan blocks and how many orphans you can have. But I don't have time to go into that. But it is quite fun, trust me. And also, um, yeah, yeah, so you do get forks. But blockchains are essentially DAGs as well. They're just, they're just far more constrained. You can't, have, um, you can't have all these sorts of extra partial orders. So uh, yeah. Anyway, motivation. Why do we need a DAG? And what are we trying to address? So the major things we're trying to address here are decentralization and scale. There's a lot of problems with blockchain technology. There's a lot of, well, a lot of issues with blockchain technology. It's very nice, but these are perhaps two of the most talked about. There's some others as well, and uh, you know, there's a lot we'll see today. But the, the two that interest me the most is the decentralization issue, which really boils down to security and the usability issue, which is, uh, yeah, uh, the scalability issue, which is kind of usability. The, uh, we just like, had an example of, um, of uh, music and that sort of thing, streaming music. And 
yeah, scale's still not there. Uh, so where do these come from? Well, do these issues seem to stem from the use of blocks of transactions? And that might be the case. So uh, for example, mm, Microsoft has run into a reporting error. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so just trying to just gonna get this back on track. Yeah, okay, so um what we the aims of this thing that we tried to create. Uh, the aims of the um, entire project were, can we create a system where you're rewarded for individual effort? So the, the major problem, and we're probably all aware of this, are mining pools are causing a bit of an issue. Um, mining pools are causing a bit of an issue because they essentially have a bit too much power. Some people think they have too much power. I tend to think they have too much power. Uh, <laughs> Can we, but I mean, they're not necessarily a bad thing. There may be, then there, there's a lot of arguments for them and against them. I don't really want to get into that, but there is, uh, there is arguably, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to have them? Yes? Yes. Uh, so can we remove the incentive for joining mining pools? That was one of the questions. And also, whilst we're doing this, is it possible to also allow for faster transaction processing? So what if we could just broadcast transactions with a proof of work attached, right? Collect these transactions and build a graph out of them and then, and then do we even need blocks? This is sort of, this is the DAG-based thinking, at least. Right, and uh, why is this important? Because decentralization, uh, you know, we need, is 51% honest users enough? No, no, that for ages. We didn't even, I mean, this paper explained this, uh, but it's not just that. There's also stuff about this before that. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm getting carried away here, I think, but. Uh, yeah, anyway, um, so what is decentralization anyway? Okay, so this, is, this one's a far trickier issue because um, it's kind of mixed up with notions of uh, distributed design. So you might rightly ask, what do we really mean by decentralization? And I think actually trying to answer that question is kind of tricky. There's been a, there are quite a few people who actually have some thoughts on what we really mean by decentralization, especially in cryptocurrencies. So, uh, but... Roughly, we kind of want lots of independent machines all over the world running the same system. Um, it would also be nice if we had that the machines were sort of computationally equivalent. Um, and like I say, it's nothing new. People have been saying this for a while. Uh, but what are these essentially we're talking about? We're kind of talking about mining pools and mining farms. You see, because in the independent machines all over the world running the, the same system, Really, machines are running sort of one mining pool system. And would it be nice if also the machines were computationally equivalent? We have mining farms, so we have essentially one machine that has a lot of power. Um, and really, the second issue is not something that I think DAGs can necessarily deal with. It depends on the, the functionality. But, um, but also, scale is a major issue as well. So when we talk about blockchains, why are we, why are we concerned about scale? Well, because blockchains have this sort of linear set of blocks where one transaction refers to the next. Um, the problem is, no matter what sort of blockchain you're dealing with, blocks contain a certain amount of transactions. Um, they have a certain period in which transactions can come in. Um, as we just heard, you know, we know the, the limits for Ethereum, we know the limits for Bitcoin. Um, and part of this problem is because we have blocks and we stick them with so many transactions. So we might have two, two different blocks where one contains transactions T1 to Tn and one is T1 to Tn prime, right? So, and, and we don't know if maybe they're the same, maybe they're the same list of transactions, maybe they're not. Uh, with a blockchain, we end up with, if we get a split, we have to pick one. And this is, and you know, this is sort of a fork, right? So um, we're now waiting to see which one will become extended before we can 
sort of say which, which transactions we know. So if I had some transactions in T prime, I now would have to wait for them to be uh, included again somewhere later. So we can't like rely on the transactions being included. Um, and of course, this is a generalization. You could of course have tons and tons of, you could imagine that maybe some freak uh, occurrence, you have tons of uh, blocks which are produced at the same time. Um, with blockchains plus, which is uh, Ethereum and this sort of uh, ghost protocol stuff, you have um, uncle blocks which can be included. Now, that's a really smart idea, but you're not including the transactions. So you can include, so you can still reward someone for their effort, which is a, which is a really, really smart idea of creating this extra block, which is nice because you, people should be rewarded for their trying, but you are still not including the transactions. So essentially the, the whole idea was, can we also have a system like this where you create a new block and you include the transactions from both T and T uh, prime, sort of the union of the transactions. Um, yeah. So this is the graph chain, essentially. Um, the question was, what if the, so the, the things we had were, what if there's no blocks? Transactions just refer to previous transactions and as many as you like. Um, to post a transaction, you simply collect transactions that you agree with and you refer to them and you sort of attach some proof of work to the transaction. Now, how can this work, right? Well, we can define abstractly a sort of proof of work function. So it's quite easy to, uh, so, so this is quite an abstract idea, uh, but it's like realized in practice quite easily with uh, hash functions. So it's quite easy to say a proof of work function S takes a puzzle A and a solution B. So we can say S A B is true if B is a solution to A. And you think about say a blockchain, for example, the solution might be some sort of uh, nonce and your A is your set of transactions and your link to the previous block and all that other data. So what we want to be able to do is quantify the work. So we can say the work of this, of, um, this proof of work function equals D, right? Just for some, so, and we can do this. Most of the time we can do this. We can say if you can um, partially uh, invert a hash function, you can sort of say, well, it must have taken this much computational effort or we expect it to have taken this much computational effort. So we are able to do this. And, the re and, why, and this is happening already because mining pools are essentially doing the same thing. Mining pools take, um, if you work for a mining pool, you're not solving the block and then handing it to them. You're proving you're working for them by showing them that you have, inverted, uh, that you have solved it to a lesser extent. So maybe if it's in Bitcoin, you want to find a value below a certain threshold. You, you are showing them that you, are, you have found solutions that are below a higher threshold, but at least it shows you're working for them. Um, so essentially, we can use the same sort of thing. So the idea to quantify how much work has been directed towards solving a certain puzzle. Um, so like I say, abstract function can be anything where we have somehow quantifiable as to how hard it is to find a solution for a puzzle. So we don't even need hash functions. You can imagine doing this with something else. Again, we kind of tried to envisage this as a framework. Um, yeah, so um, we can kind of broadcast transactions with an associated work value. And the point of doing this is that we can say like, oh, here's a block and it has work value eight, for example. Um, so you take your, your DAG again, and then you can maybe imagine some numbers and you can say, okay, now we've got all these numbers, what does, what does that mean? Good question. Um, let's return, so, uh, so we, what we do is we define these two notions of weight and height. So this is very similar to uh, the blockchain in the, in the respect that you have an accumulated amount of work. And what we can say is once we label the graph with work values, we can now, have, we can now label it with other values. So for weight, for example, we have this cumulative uh, work associated with the transaction and all of its descendants. And the height is the cumulative work associated with the transaction and all of its ancestors. So for example, um, it's kind of gone off the screen a bit here, but you can kind of see that if you, essentially the weight is adding up all of the proof of work value to each of these transactions. And so we're able to say the weight of a transaction is 61. Why do we want to say this? Because it gives us an idea, it gives us a slowly building up idea of how embedded this transaction is in the system. 
For height, you have, you have a system where you count um, the all the descendant transactions. Uh, interestingly enough, you are also counting the transaction itself, um, number 12. So you would say, so this transaction up here, this, this uh, darker red one, we could say it has a height of 80, but essentially it just means, these are just toy examples, of course, but essentially what we're trying to say is we can build up this idea of how tall in the graph a transaction is based on the proof of work it's built on, right? And, um, and there's one other thing we have to do in a DAG-based system, which is we need to start to eliminate transactions that are further down. And the reason that we have to do this is because it, if you are given a new graph, so you haven't seen any transactions recently, and you have to suddenly work out how high they are, it's, um, it gets quickly quite computationally expensive depending uh, as the number of transactions in the system blows up. So you have to limit this and eventually get, start to get rid of transactions that are further back. Um, this is kind of a separate thing, and it's a little bit more involved of how you might get rid of this, so um, maybe I can talk about this a bit more later. But um, yeah, there's added complexity in doing this DAG-based design, which is quite tricky. Um, but in, uh, in essence, this allows you, if you can do this, what we want to do is we want to get this property of convergence. So it's if transactions can just refer to any other previous transactions, what is stopping users, uh, yeah, so what is stopping users creating um, new transactions at very old nodes? So for example, uh, here, like all of my graphs, you see these like transactions are like, the number nine there is referring to this 13 and 14, but why wouldn't it just refer to this 11? You need incentives. And this is, part of the, um, this is part of the framework as well. So we need incentives. We want users to build from the top of the graph. So reward is tied to some function of the height. So um, for simplicity, I have just wrote reward equals some function of height. However, it's not quite as simple as that, because obviously, if the function was, um, uh, say, an inverse function, it wouldn't work very well. So um, yeah. Uh, but you do need you do need some sort of function of the height in order to uh, in order to create this incentive for working from the front, and the point in doing this is that we're then able to form transactions and encourage people to work at the very front of the transaction. We leave this unspecified because again we were trying to develop a framework. Um, yeah, so the point in convergence is you end up with a green transaction that essentially is at the top of the top of the list. It's the converged transaction, and every other transaction below it is now part of its ancestry. And by based on the function, everyone wants to go for this new green transaction. If you're going to build and create a new transaction, you will refer to this top one. That's the idea, right? So we also have to worry about something else, though. We have to worry about something like double spending. So let's consider a, uh, a double spending scenario. You have a transaction uh, graph like this, and suddenly these two red transactions are sort of double spending some sort of money. OK. So how do you overcome this? And this is kind of, um, so how do you overcome this? You compare these. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you kind of end up in this situation where you have to compare these and then decide which one you want to go on. But imagine if you have, with an active adversary situation, we can kind of generalize the split in the system to what if the adversary wants to essentially keep the system split forever? Um, you can generalize this to basically two graphs that can't be built upon because you can't refer to two conflicting transactions, right? And what we can say is, um, do they need to double spend and make sure uh, the system uh, never converges? Uh, so the, the, the stage one is to, um, um, so, so the adversary has, to, has a situation now where they have to build on one of these two transactions, and they have to outpace the rest of the network, which is trying to build on one of these transactions. So imagine a situation where the new, where the honest or rather uh, incentively compatible nodes first create a transaction that's significantly high enough to be like, this is the new, this is the actual realistic graph. The adversary then has to um, create a new transaction on the other chain. And we can give this, we can assign this some probability. And then this happens again and again and so on, and you kind of end up with this probability of one minus lambda to the t. For how many trials? So this only works, so you can sort of see that this kind of gets very uh, small very quickly. 
But this only works provided the adversary doesn't have a majority of computational power. And so this is, uh, this is one of the sort of arguments for it. Anyway, so just to give you a bit of an overview, um, create, you create transactions at your own pace. You reward for individual effort. You encourage transactions at the tip by incentives. And we allow for multiple transactions to be, uh, refer um, to be references to uh, quickly gain convergence. Proof of work um, builds up closer to real time. So the hope is that you have these much smaller transactions that are created by people and the proof of work is established by the individuals transacting and that the framework is agnostic towards a proof of work functions um, or even reward functions to some degree. Okay, um, so there are other DAG systems out there that you may have heard of. Um, IOTA is probably the most well known. It was, uh, had a significant uh, market value for a while. Um, major differences, um, there's not really any incentive. There is a sort of mining, but um, there's not really any incentives. And they're currently using coordinators. But as you can see, they're very similar be uh, in um, diagrams and stuff because they exact th their website uses uh, diagrams very similar to what I've just presented. Um, yeah, and you can look those up. Uh, they're quite interesting, actually. Um, other ones, uh, other implemented stuff are Byteball. Um, so they have this kind of difference that they're kind of seemingly similar, but they have this difference with trusted witnesses. Uh, and Nano um, kind of uses this distributed proof of stake protocol um, and conflicts are removed by voting. Uh, both of these systems are also really cool. Um, I would recommend having a look into those. Uh, they have obviously pros and cons. Our framework tries to be a bit more agnostic and a bit more decentralized. Um, uh, yeah, and anyway, so, the, so in conclusion to this talk, really, um, not only did I work on this academically, and we sort of have this paper on this, uh, I'm also a full-time at NTNU in Norway developing this framework as a work in cryptocurrency now. Uh, we want to try and develop something. Um, so I gave a talk maybe six months ago or something like that um, on this Norwegian national TV, and then afterwards they said, why did, uh, I got speaking to these TTO guys, this technology transfer office guys, and now I'm working, trying to develop this into a working cryptocurrency uh, for fun, which turns out to be really hard. Uh, but we're at the initial stage of the project. And um, so we recently just won some funding, actually, and we are looking for developers. So if anyone's interested, uh, and yeah, in summary, um, we're trying to keep or even expand the idea of a decentralized cryptocurrency. Um, and we also want a system that can scale. That's the most important thing we have. Uh, maybe it's not, maybe the scalability will be limited at some point in a practical sense. And this is something we are trying to work to find out. Um, but hopefully it's attractive to a lot of users. Uh, anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Chris. That was really interesting. Um, so again, we'll have a, a little bit of time for questions. If you have a question, ah, well, we have a question right here. So let's start there. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Could you go to the slide with the um, balancing attack? With the what, sorry? With the balancing attack, where you showed the probability of the adversary. Um, so few yeah, slides sure, back. sure. This one, yeah. yeah. Um, I think y what you're missing here is you're assuming that uh, the honest nodes kind of build on one chain, but actually the honest nodes don't know which one is the correct one, and so that adversary can balance it forever yeah, okay. with a minority of the hash rate. But uh, yeah, so you're right about that. But the thing is, um, so the adversary will have to build on both. It, 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 so if the adversary knew which one the honest nodes were building on, it would have to, um, it would have to build on, uh, it could build on the other, right? But it doesn't, so the adversary also has to build on both. So the adversary has to split its computing power as well. So this is how this, this works. And, but I am actually missing a term out here. So normally, there's a probability that the, both, that the honest players will both create this chain at the same time, right? And I am missing that out. Uh, but I kind of did that on purpose because I thought no one would notice. <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's a good point. Um, but however, yeah. Uh, so the, 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 but the major point here is that the adversary also has to split its computing power to try and extend both because it doesn't know which, which is the chain that the, active, that the rational players will extend first. Yeah, but still, like, you would like to make blocks in parallel because that's the whole point of scaling. Yeah. And then you have honest blocks from, on one chain and honest blocks on the other chain and they are approximately at the same rate. 
Yeah, okay. Because the honest nodes don't know, and you need just a little bit of hash rate to, to balance both. I think it's the approximately the same rate without the moving ahead in a significant point that becomes the becomes the term here that gets quite that, that will still become quite small quite quickly, and it obviously depends on the computing power of the adversary. Well, we can take it <laughs> offline. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, so when I spend my transaction, am I basically just referencing the previous, so is this is like the UTXO model, where I reference the previous transaction where the coins exist, and then I do my proof of work? Or is it sort of like I create a transaction, and maybe there's some commitment where I say, I believe on this branch of the tree? Um, you're not referencing, you're not necessarily referencing your own previous transaction. You're simply saying, these are the, this is what I believe to be true so far, and I'm just referencing the ones that I believe to be true. Okay, so like the entire set in a sense of yep. all the previous transactions, okay. Yep. Great. Yes, I'll just follow um, Patrick's problem. So you define a weight and height of each transaction. So yep. it, it seems the transaction or blocks with higher weight or height will be more trustworthy, right? Yeah. So when a block tries to refer previous blocks Will it uh, be biased towards previous blocks that have higher weight or height, so um, that the previous blocks with smaller weight and height will never be chosen and become like less and less trustworthy? So um, you're basically incentivized to create the highest, to create, to create the most height. So the idea is that e the hope is that even if you have smaller transactions with only a small amount of height, as long as they haven't already been included, you'll get, you're gaining that essentially for free by referencing them. Okay. So the idea is, yeah. Great, thank you. No, no problem. Cool. Uh, well, I thought this was really uh, exciting stuff, Chris. It, uh, I've just about come to terms with the nice, neatly arranged linear blocks in a row, and, and this hash stuff is uh, really blowing my mind. Um, my final question then would be, uh, given that this looks like, to me at least, quite a different system, do you think this is something that existing blockchains like Bitcoin or Ethereum could adopt? Or is this really something for like next generation blockchains? Yeah, I doubt they would adopt this. Because, uh, I mean, I think, I think especially when you look at the communities, there's no, there's, it's very, very difficult to get, to get significant change. Um, and I think this is part of the reason that we're trying to develop this to sort of show that this is, this is really a feasible system that would work. And then may, but you may see that this might be, uh, uh, perhaps my hope is that this is maybe adopted by newer players. Cool. Well, uh, thank you, Chris. That was really exciting. Thanks.